Hey everybody, this is CSC Tim. I'll be the man behind the cam for this week's trio reveal. And we're gonna go ahead right away and hand it off to um, Mark and Ben. Please make some noise in chat if you can hear me. All right, cool, we got it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so welcome to uh, the next class reveal uh, for Camelot Unchained. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just an apology uh, for those of you who've been on the forums. I let you guys know that, ooh, on Saturday I came down with, you know, the plague, cold, whatever. So I'm still kind of whipped. Uh, so Ben's going to be doing a lot more talking today. <laughs> Aren't you lucky, Ben? Yay. Yay. Makes me happy. Uh, so that's one. Uh, second bit, uh, there won't be a Friday Night Fights today. Sorry. Uh, I'll cover it in the update. We've been making some major changes uh, on the back end uh, of our tech. Uh, basically going from 32-bit um, to 64-bit. Uh, and that is taking just a little bit longer. It's a really good thing uh, for us. We were going to do it anyway. It was just a matter of when. So we thought get it done sooner rather than later. Now we're hoping we'll have a test up. Uh, when you get a second. Oh, we're hoping we are going to have a test up tonight, uh, but it will not be a Friday night fight. So that's the bad stuff. So uh, take a quick break and see what Tim wants. Uh, we're just saying we've got some problems with camera focus, so I'm going to take care of that real quick. Oh, yeah. okay. You mean camera focus? What did I say? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Andrew is ripping off all the bad bits. All right. That's so, what's happening. Uh, come on in and tell them, Andrew. Story time. Story time. I don't have my hat. Oh, uh, <laughs> here, come. Uh, my pumpkin, though. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it, it's been a week of ripping off all the band-aids, taking all the technical debt, paying it, um, a ton of stuff that we've sort of put off to get things done, and now everything from 64-bit to uh, everything to Visual Studio to a whole lot of things like that, so... Basically, all the stuff that we've been putting off is getting done, and now we're... It's like ripping off the band-aids and feeling pain. So, <laughs> uh, we hope to have it all done by uh, last night. Uh, didn't quite make it, but I'm trying hard. I'm trying real hard. He is. He's been putting in so. hours. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So that's the bad, you know, the only bad news, and frankly, it's good news because we had to do it, and it's better doing it now than later. So uh, good news. Um, next week, uh, the long-awaited store front will be seen for the game uh, for Camelot Unchained uh, for the studio. We're going to have a preview of it that you guys can look at, give us feedback. You'll be able to see what we're going to offer, the pricing, all sorts of stuff. We're also going to have a live stream about it to give you more details than you probably want to know about the store. Uh, we are very happy. The They are our, par our partner, who we'll announce next week, is very happy. And, you know, hopefully you'll like the preview. And we're doing something really cool, uh, which we'll also talk about next week, in terms of how, uh, frankly, uh, the store is going to open. So I think they'll like that. So, enough with all the homework, uh, you know, housekeeping, excuse me, yeah, see, homework, housekeeping, brain, not all the way there today, um, and let's get to the important uh, bit, which is the class reveal, the, uh, the class reveal. I don't even know what class we're revealing today, because the vote was so close, and it's gone back and forth so many times. This was a crazy one. I mean, <laughs> this was a, literally from almost the time voting opened. The difference between the two groups, or the two uh, trios, was less than 10 votes. It was just nuts. You know, we're watching it and going, okay, what should, which one should we prepare? And normally, you know, certainly by Wednesday, we have a really good idea who's going to win. And frankly, by, by the end of the day Friday, we have a, uh, a decent idea. <laughs> we had none. It was 10 votes, or 8 votes, or 6 votes, and it was just... It was crazy. But, finally, we closed it on voting. Uh, and at that point, the winner was uh, letter G, 
which is our scouts. All right, so if you guys want to check them out, you can go to our website, camelotandchain.com, click on classes up at the top, and here's our silhouette for G, and here they are revealed, and let's throw up some names. There you go. So because this is a, a much shorter reveal than the last <laughs> one in terms of components, we'll just sit here for, you know, very short amount of time while you guys check it out. So no juggling. Well, we have a, we have a pumpkin uh, and, you know, we'll sit for a minute. You don't get the cool music this time either. No. Oh. No. drop the link in chat for you guys. <laughs> Please talk, it feels creepy. Oh. Aww. <laughs> See, we're going to need the music every time now if we're going to give them an opportunity to, to read with uh, before they start talking about stuff. But yeah, this is, what, one of the the first uh, stretch goal classes here? Hopefully. Hopefully well, the, we have the spirit we, pets. We did, I think, in the Kickstarter, was the archers were a stretch goal, weren't they? Correct. And oh, then, okay. That's what you meant. I yeah, thought yeah. you were talking about... Post Kickstarter. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. But uh, this was part of part of stealth, obviously. So mm -hmm. it's just one of not not the actual stealth classes that will be you know more combat focused, but it's part of that and, mm -hmm. and part of the same uh, the same stretch goal. Mm -hmm. I think it's long enough. Yeah, we'll talk. Th you think they understand? Yeah, a I think bit? they understand by now. I mean, the scouts are actually pretty easy to get from the information we put out. So the basic, you know, look, the basic pr uh, purpose of these uh, boys and girls is to, I don't know, scout. <laughs> you know, it's not, as we said during the, uh, the discussion on stealth, these folks are not out there to kill, to maim, to destroy, to score points, you know, by knocking out uh, their opponents. Their role in this game is really unique. Uh, and when I say unique, I mean, how many other classes do you know in other games where your primary focus is the scout? Yeah. Like, this is uh, the, probably the most unique role that we have, because this is something that you couldn't have in a PvE game. Like, you don't have characters that are just to go around and, and find out information and try to evade discovery. This is something that you can do in PvP in uh, context of other games you'll sometimes see this type of thing in uh, like single player missions and stuff where you have to like sneak into the enemy base and you know mark the targets for for certain things so it's not a completely unique mechanic but it's unique to uh, a multiplayer environment like this where we're exclusively having PvP and therefore information is a valuable commodity exactly and so that's going to be um, interesting <laughs> you know for us to uh, design and to balance but it's going to be a fun one and I think if you uh, are looking right now, and hopefully you all already have her doing it right now, uh, you'll see that we took a really kind of different approach to these scouts. You know, these are not uh, your guys dressed uh, in leather and just wandering out to the woods and, you know, doing scouting. We're taking this to, you know, a kind of BSC level for the <laughs> scouts. And I think the perfect, ex the first class to start with and that's you know a pretty good well crazy idea uh, are the specters uh, these guys these scouts for the Arthurians are like the other scouts in the sense that they're not normal they're not typical they're not your average you know class or you know uh, well you know just your average class yeah so the specters 
uh, this is kind of like the introduction to the way that the scouting classes uh, work in general, go through this transformation. So they start out as being just a, a normal character and they can wear armor and use weapons and things, but they're not up to the caliber of other combat characters when it comes to actually fighting. But they go around as, as sort of their normal form and they find the area that they want to scout in and then they transform, in this case they transform into a specter, which is this sort of ghostly uh, shadowy character and then they use that actually to go out and you know have uh, better concealment having stealth uh, having faster movement speed and having some bonuses that allow them to go out and use these different scouting specific abilities to move around and detect enemies and kind of discover what's what's around in an area and try not to be noticed as much as possible um, which is kind of specifically as far as this class in the trio they're more focused about not being noticed than some of the other ones are, which which focus a little bit more on active ability use for other purposes. Uh, Spectres really want not to be discovered. They really want you know enemies not to take notice of them and to gather as much information and and get back out without getting into any trouble. Exactly, but that won't be the only thing they're going to do. I mean, obviously, one of the things we talked about during you know stealth, and we will continue to talk about, is that they're going to have other roles as well, just not purely combat. Con that, 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 that. combat focused in terms of killing people uh, you know whether they'll be a little bit more like poltergeist maybe a little bit uh, in terms of fear spells or uh, fear abilities uh, there'll be more to them than simply just scouting scouting is a big role for them it's the most important role but that would get kind of I don't want to say boring but it would be hard to just do that you know, as a class. Yeah. Uh, so we want to make sure that there'll be other things that they can do. And, you know, the good thing about this class, since it's not announced as a launch class, but it'll be coming afterwards, we'll have more time to work on it, which we certainly will need to make sure that even though this is a very highly specialized class, that it's still a really fun one to play. Yeah, and you can see one of the examples of that actually in their uh, Divine Intervention, which is Sabotage. So you can apply a, an effect to something that will then set off as a, a trap basically on, on that object when enemies get close to it. So there's things like that where that's indirect, it's not directly you know, find an enemy and do something to them as much as it is doing things in a more sneaky way. And I think that's going to be a, an interesting theme to try to work onto. Um, but as Mark said, like this is probably the most difficult trio to actually design because these are mechanics that aren't common in other games. I haven't ever designed a scout class before, so uh, they're a little bit uh, not as far along as some of the other classes are, which have more well understood mechanics that are that are easier uh, to have analogies analogies to in other uh, in other past games. Yeah, that pretty much sums up the uh, spectrums. <laughs> so let's move on to the uh, realm of uh, the TDD and to the Wisps. Uh, for those who are familiar uh, with mythology from that area, the Will of the Wisp, a wisp, really common, a uh, bit of folklore, and one that uh, is also going to be a lot of fun to weave into this game. I mean, the idea of these uh, creatures that can be seen as glowing lights at times, that can be very effective at scouting at one time, a little less effective, scouting at other times, um, it is going to be fun too, I think. Yeah, and this concept actually, uh, not not the, the Wisp specifically, but the Lantern concept, which is the mechanic that they use, actually came out of concept art, which was exactly. for, I don't remember what it was originally for, but we were doing a bunch of concepts regarding something, and one of the concepts had this lantern in it, and it was casting a shadow, and the shadow was doing things, and it was acting as an entity, and so that... Uh, just for some of you who might be interested, you know, where ideas come from and how classes get made, you know, from whatever inspiration happens upon, you know, the studio at the time. So this is, the lantern idea for these actually came out of something that was completely unrelated, but then has been sort of commandeered into this role as being the house for the wisp to live in. Exactly. Oh, and that's a really important thing here, uh, and certainly was at Mythic too in the early days. Um, ideas should come from anyone, can come from anyone. And it doesn't matter whether that person is an artist, a game designer, programmer, HR. <laughs> I mean, anyone who has a good idea, or backers as well, anyone who has a good idea who can contribute something to this game, I'm happy because that makes my life so much easier. <laughs> you know, it makes Ben's life easier. And, you know, as he said, this is a perfect example of how an artist who wasn't 
even thinking that that idea of a lantern would apply to a scout class, we've taken it and run with it. Yeah. And I think, in a, again, a really interesting way. Yeah, and I think this will be a very interesting class to play. And, and it sort of does share that commonality that kind of defines this trio as a, a thing, right? Where the lantern sort of acts in a way of you go out to the area with your lantern, and then you deploy your wisp from it, and then the wisp goes around and does the scouting as this, you know, other entity and gets these extra abilities that they can use, but then they're dependent on that lantern and getting back to it and regenerating and having that sort of anchor so that you're not this permanent uh, fixture that can just go out and kind of sit in an area and observe things forever. You do have to take an active role and move around and discover things in an area and go back and regenerate and have this sort of cyclical behavior and then uh, as the player with their own character entity actually moves to a new location, then their wisp can extend across the new range based on where they've deployed uh, their lantern again. So that will be sort of a way to cover areas and have there be a more active role. Um, and the wisp specifically is more uh, illumination focused, so they have a lot to do with the light and how, how well they can be seen and how well they illuminate areas to allow other people to be seen. So I, I sort of think of the Wisp as being this finger pointer sort of a class. If they had fingers, they're just this little glowy ball. But they sort of like point out things. So if uh, if you have a Wisp in an area and you have other combatants in an area and it's dark or something and you know there's not a lot of vision because we'll have you know actual real night in this game and actual darkness. If there's a Wisp and they're like, okay, I'm going to go over to where these enemies are and I'm going to light them all up for people. Like that's sort of a, one of the things that they can do that kind of makes them different from the other scouts is that they really want to highlight enemies and allow their allies to uh, sort of coordinate with them in that sort of a way. And th that is usual as an example of how we have non-mirrored classes. That just with the first two, the difference between the Spectre and the Whips hugely apparent, you know, and really important. Uh, we, you know, and we're going to keep saying this probably for all the reveals, at least I hope so. I think based on what we've done so far, we can say it, uh, that these guys are all non-mirrored, and they all have different ways to play, and it's not just a matter of, ooh, we slapped a different class name on something, changed the stats a little, uh, and called it non-mirrored classes. These are truly, like the other reveals, non-mirrored classes. Yep. So, um, well, if you look at the Death Curse, that's actually one of my uh, <laughs> fun favorite ones. Um, you yeah, know, that's called Burst. And so think of it as just this great light show, right? Yeah. So the Wisp, the Wisp is dying, and he or she wants to, uh, oh, leave the battle with a smile on her face and maybe not so much on the enemies, and bursts into this great pyrotechnic, you know, effect that I'm sure Mike Crossmeyer is already <laughs> trying to figure out uh, how is he going to make it work and not bring the frame rate down to zero. Mm -hmm. But it should be a cool one. It should be fun on the battlefield. Um, it's not, it's, I won't say it's the most unusual one, but it's one of the more unusual ones. Yeah. You know, it's not just, do I do damage and, you know, ooh, I'm draining a little more blood. It's kind of a cool one. What makes it unusual, I think, in this case, is that uh, we're actually applying the death curse not to the character themselves, but to their wisp, mm -hmm. which is different That's from the true. other classes because you're not your character isn't actually dying, your transformed form is actually dying, but it, your character is staying alive. So it's this is a very uh, different way that we're taking some of these commonalities across all these different classes and applying them in different ways. Okay, so the last uh, member of the trio uh, are the Arisen. Uh, we, <laughs> like has happened with a few of the names, mm. uh, the original name for this was the Druger, uh, and for anyone who's familiar with Viking lore or oh, other games like ESO, mm -hmm. uh, essentially that means a revenant, which by the way was our second choice for a name. Uh, and then we saw that Guild Wars 2 had come out with their revenant class, and it's like, yeah, well, not so much. Uh, that wouldn't be a great idea. Not because it's a big deal, obviously, it, it's revenant is a common name, but it would have just kind of looked cheesy. Yeah. You know, they announce their uh, uh, expansion packet comes out, and hey, we're going to have a Revenant too. So for now, the name is the uh, simply the Unrisen, and they are the Viking Scout, and very heavily tied, you know, into Viking uh, mythology. 
Yeah, the Draugr concept is an actual very interesting story. It's it's a good thing to look up if you uh, if you're interested in it. But it's essentially a Viking zombie, right? So, as opposed to these other classes that are able to does that mean this game is like The Walking? No, sorry, go ahead. I don't. Could be. <laughs> but uh, that kind of ties into their mechanic and how it's different, right? Is this is actually a character that goes out and commits suicide effectively to cause themselves to become undead and then go around as being this sort of zombie character and doing these things to uh, become harder to detect and going out and scouting and discovering things and also being more of a pest, I think, as, mm -hmm. as opposed to the other ones where, you know, the specter is kind of trying to be sneaky, the wisp is kind of trying to, like, point out and, and help with mm -hmm. targeting and stuff. This guy is kind of... Uh, an annoyance. He, he goes out and actually bothers people, and he doesn't necessarily do damage because he's not, you know, using a lot of weapons and abilities, but he has some debuffs to him. He will want to actually get into areas where enemies do notice him, and he causes some trouble for them, and might actually have some roles where he can coordinate more closely with, with groups as opposed to if he's just solo by himself, he might not want to get into that sort of a situation because then he would really be in trouble because he would be more of a focus. Mm -hmm. But if he has other people to kind of draw the focus away from him, he might be able to kind of fit in there in sort of a supportive role uh, that is a little bit more flexible in that kind of a way because he does have some capabilities of actually influencing things that might be important to combat situations. Exactly. And, uh, you know, even his death curse, too. <laughs> you know, is a fun one with... Because, frankly, nothing says zombie like hands cr coming up out of the ground uh, and grabbing at people, because that's just fun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, okay, so three classes. Uh, three totally non-mirrored classes, very different play styles, very different looks, very different abilities. And frankly, that's all I think we need to say on this, right? Well, time for questions. I think so. Yeah. Okay, guys and gals, it's question time. Uh, as uh, usual, first question should be about uh, the scouts. Uh, if after a while we don't get enough scouty questions, we'll move on to any questions about the store or the other classes revealed so far. And if we don't get enough questions after that, well, we'll just leave. <laughs> no, we won't, but we'll answer more questions. So, go for it, folks. All right, here we go. We've got a bunch of questions already. We're going to start off with uh, Una, Jand Una, Una Giandro says, Regarding the deployable Wisp, can you describe a bit about the independent control between the Scout and the Wisp? Will it be feasible to control both at once and utify, utilize the class effectively as the class being split apart into two forms, so to speak? Okay, so this is a little bit uh, leaning on some of the tech that we're going to be developing for spirit classes, which, by the way, is sort of why spirit classes in the stretch goal order were before this, uh, this class is. So essentially what you'll do is you will transfer your control from your main character to the Wisp itself, and then you'll be basically playing the game as the Wisp, and then you can use the mode ability to kind of toggle back and forth but you can only control sort of one at once. So there's not, it's not like a pet where you're actually running around as a character and then using pet commands to make pet orders and having it move around separately from yourself. You're actually playing from the perspective of the Wisp, which can travel fairly far from wherever the player's body is. And in this case, it's actually from the lantern. So you can actually go to a location, put down your lantern and then leave, and then transfer it to the Wisp that's inside of the lantern and then run around that way, keeping your character much safer. And then, uh, as I think is even mentioned in the abilities, if your character were to die for some reason, but the lantern is still there and the wisp is still there, you're basically fine even though mm -hmm. your character is dead. So there's a very uh, strong disconnect between these two things and they're actually kind of separate entities and the player's sort of uh, incorporeal control into the game world is being transferred from one thing to another but they're actually two separate things. Okay, we've got a bunch of questions about uh, rewarding and progression for scouting. So if you guys want just, to talk about just that Just generally bit. rewarding for scouting. So scouting uh, is going to be very different from the way that other uh, classes work in terms of Should rewards. Should we do the scouts? Same way. <laughs> <laughs> because they are not going around killing people. And so a, a lot of the things to do with damage and healing and stuff are not generally going to apply but they're still using abilities and since our progression system is generally usage based and has a lot of uh, 
properties tied to the success or failure of those usages, a lot to do with the context. You know, if you're using something in an important situation versus in an unimportant situation off in the middle of nowhere, that's sort of different. So uh, because you're able to play an active role as a scout, you're not going to get rewarded for just standing around idling and looking at things. You're going to actually have to use your ability. So some of these abilities will notice talk about marking things, um, going out and actually take, taking note of specific targets and then being able to report those back and help contribute to the intelligence of the realm of like what's in an area that sort of thing will get you points in terms of the progression system but just sort of standing around looking at things even if there's a lot going on but you're not actively doing anything probably will not be a, a very rewarding thing for you to pursue so one of the interesting ways to look at this class is we've said from the beginning that we're not going to have pve progression right this is an rvr you know centric game uh, over your focus game. In a weird way, you could actually look at a scout. A lot of with it, a lot of its behavior is almost a PVE class, though, because you don't have to actually fight other players, right? So I think there'll be a lot of players who might, a lot of potential players who might actually be interested in playing this class, even though they're not great at what is the center of RVR, which is combat. You know, if you like running around in a world, if you like scouting and, and looking for other players, but not, maybe you kind of think you suck at killing them, <laughs> you, this is a really interesting class to look at and to consider. Because it doesn't require you to go and be great in combat. It doesn't require you to worry about uh, your, at your bar, uh, bars in our case, uh, like you would for the other classes. You don't have to worry about positionals, reactives, knowing everything that your enemy uh, has because you're not generally fighting them in that way. So I think there may be a, uh, some appeal here for players who have been looking at this game and going, well, I'm interested in the races, I'm interested in the lore, but I'm just not very good at RVR combat or PvP well, combat. Well, I, I, I don't know. If, like, that, it could be a concern that you're not very good. It could be a concern that you just don't like that confrontational sort of situation. Sure. Like, you're just worried about you don't like people ganking you. You don't like, you know, feeling like people are, you know, picking on you or, or trying to ruin your experience or whatever. But if you're just sort of having this sort of ambient uh, sort of walk around and you're trying to be careful and, like, if you die, it's not really necessarily a big deal to you because you're not competing with other people directly you're not it's not a you or them you win you lose it's more of a like well I'll see how much stuff I can find and your achievement is basically you know I find more stuff before I get uh, destroyed and then I re emerge and start doing it again or I move to a new area that experience is very different and so exactly. it's, it's something that is not very similar to a lot of other you know MMO PvP experiences so it might be something that attracts people who thought I'm gonna play this game as a crafting game because crafting is, exactly. even in an RVR world, it's a crafting experience and it's not directly having this conflict. A lot of scouts probably are going to also want to avoid that conflict and just want to go around and scout. Mm -hmm. So that could be a, an alternative means to play this game as a less conflict-based character. Exactly. And you're also going to get lots of pats on your head uh, from <laughs> other players when you do something right. So. You know, it's a really, it may be a very interesting way, again, for people who aren't in interested in that confrontational style, or just, again, think they can't keep up with the more hardcore players, but still want to feel part of the world, just like crafting, uh, still want to contribute, still work with their friends in a guild who might actually be more interested in RVR, they could still join them, help out, and sometimes be really useful, uh, because like everything else, in our progression system, if you do well, you're going to get, re as a scout, you're going to get recognized by the realm, regardless of whether you kill anyone, because frankly, killing isn't, you know, your number one focus. Mm -hmm. um, extending on that question just a little bit more, it was asked, um, can you elaborate a little bit on how uh, gameplay might differ between a neophyte scout and a high level scout? You know, a DPS might do a little bit more damage and grow horizontally. A tank might get a little bit tankier and get some other extra up skills. What makes a, a a year five scout better than a day one scout? Well, the same thing, Tim. Uh, so if you look at the horizontal system, 
we can allow, this is one of the areas that if we were going to allow a little bit more verticality, or one of the classes, that if we wanted to allow a little bit more verticality, we could. For example, take the range for the wisps. Uh, at the end of the day, if we said, well, that for the wisps range from lantern was a little bit more vertical than our other skills, it's not really a big deal. It's not really something that's going to unbalance the game. It's not something that's going to, you know, really, well, can't turn the tide in RVR. On the other hand, certain skills we would not want to do that to. If you have effects, or when you have your abilities that have effect on active RVR, on active combat, uh, we would want to stay horizontal. So I think, you know, these very specialized classes give us a really interesting way to introduce a little verticality if we want to, but also introduce a whole bunch of other horizontal, you know, base skills that are, you know, a little bit fun, a little bit, you know, more useful uh, without them, without worrying about them unbalancing combat, which is still the heart, you know, of the RVR game. Yeah, and, and I think this class, even though it's more narrow than you would think of a normal class with its, you know, variety of trees and uh, different abilities to, to specialize into, there's still specialization within scouting because as we were sort of saying, you can have sort of your evasiveness and how difficult you are to detect. You can have your speed and how, how quickly you can cover areas. Um, you're going to have different uh, things like we were talking about traps and sabotage and, and stuff that you can actually do that affect enemies. And so there's going to be different ways that you can think about how you're playing your character. Do you want to be just a total passive evasive sort of character that you know people don't detect and you sort of don't want to even run into other people or do you want to be the type of character that sort of either is part of a group or is uh, off of a group but there is operating in an area where there's combat taking place and you're kind of contributing towards fights that happen um, you can get better at these different things with possibly some trade-offs of maybe your abilities are stronger to uh, go out and help your group but you can't last as long or you can last a really long time, but you can't really do a whole lot other than go out and actually just scout and detect things. So there will be some, some horizontal uh, progression as far as your diversity of, of different things that you can learn to do and different things you focus on, because you do have abilities and your different abilities will do different things. Which ones you progress and which ones you subsequently unlock will be different depending on your choices. Um, lots of questions in terms of group versus solo play. How do you see them fitting into a group? Are these guys only for solo play? So can we just elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I think you did. I, well, yeah. It's uh, This is probably one of the uh, least combat-focused roles in, in the game. It's, it's like putting a crafter in your group, right? There are reasons that you would want to do it, but you're... you're group stated objective has to be driven by that, right? If you're going out there and you are just going out to, you know, kill people, you don't necessarily need a lot of intelligence. You know, if you're going into a siege battle and you already know where the enemies are because they're at their, their fort or their, their keep or whatever, and you're going there to just fight them, you don't necessarily need a lot of intelligence. But in order to determine how many enemies are at that keep beforehand, you know, you might have scouting parties that go out and actually, okay, how, how much defense do they have? How many resources do they have to repair the damage that we're going to do to them? Can we attrition them down? Stuff like that. Or if you're trying to set up, uh, you know, caravan uh, interruption, uh, going, going out and destroying caravans of, of enemies, you want to find where those caravans are and if they're running and, and how long it will take them to get from place to place so that your group can detect these things and scouts are going to be much better than normal characters at covering distance and finding things over the large open world that we have in order to figure out where you're going to need to go. So having a scout in your group if you're on a roam might be really, really important, but if you're just in the middle of a siege, not as important as maybe having another, you know, siege mage. And also in the depths, right? Well, that's going to be a whole other... <laughs> When, when we start talking about how every class interacts with the depths is, is going to be another whole thing because that's it's going to be a crazy place, there's going to be a lot of things going on, and scouting the depths is going to be possibly a very important thing for you to do because there are a lot of surprises that you won't find out about necessarily otherwise. Um, this sort of affects them and sort of doesn't, but I like the question. Um, I think before we had mentioned some components that specifically target living targets. 
Um, do specters, zombies, and Dullahan fall into the dead category? Yes, they're dead. Okay. They're, they are undead, um, which there will be some things that probably are specifically targeted to corpses of things that are Absolutely. on the ground and don't have Absolutely. any gameplay implications that you can't do to an undead creature. But a lot of the things that are just, this thing has to be dead, probably will apply to things whether they're reanimated or not. So, so there there will be some overlap there, but probably not everything. Fireballs don't care. Fireballs don't care if you <laughs> swords don't care. <laughs> uh, Fredguard asks, with a class dedicated towards gathering information as its main purpose, what kind of information will be strong enough to gather in order for this class to be worth having over other classes? Oh, lots of things. Hmm. I mean, lots of things. I mean, again, if you're going out in an eight man and you're looking for other groups to fight, or at, at times you want to avoid other groups. Being able to send a guy out in the distance who moves very quickly, who can move hidden, uh, who can, you know, really give you the kind of intelligence that can save you a lot of time, or blow well, an ambush over a hill, for example. Having them, really handy. Uh, same thing in the depths. Uh, so. There's going to be so many things you can do, and as Ben mentioned as well, looking at sieges, getting behind enemy lines, helping to disrupt things. These guys are not just about gathering information. That's their number one focus. They also have, as you know, Ben has talked about, or has mentioned a couple of times, other things in their arsenal. They're not just about gathering intel. That's, w that's what they're really, really good at, but they have to have other things to do as well, and they will. Yeah. They have to. You can sort of look at this as like utility being sort of their secondary role. So they're not exactly a, a support character or a debuffing character or or something like that where like that's their, their main thing because they really are about going out and finding things and moving quickly and, and discovering information and reporting information back. But that's not all they do. It's, it's like how we've talked about with some of our other classes where they have a main focus and then they'll have some other things that they can also do. Mm -hmm. So this... Classes aren't necessarily in this case, and uh, you know, as we talked about, if you've read the current uh, newsletter that we just released talking about how we're changing our archetypes, this is a, a good example of that, of characters having a sort of multifaceted uh, interest to them where they sort of have a primary thing that they're very interested in, but that's not necessarily comprehensive of all of the things that they can do. And that's one of the things that's really important, and we've touched on it now in multiple reveals as well as when we talked about uh, the change in the past. Uh, being able to have a character like this, to have a class like this, that is more tightly focused uh, is a really good thing. But tightly focused also doesn't mean you can only do one thing. It just means you can have fewer number of things you can do, but those things can be different. It could be column A, B, C, D, and E, or F as far as we wanted, but that total number of abilities was still down, was still, you know, smaller than other classes. And that's one of the reasons that I think this approach that we're taking now is going to work out really well for us. Yeah, it, it's really just that you can't be divergent anymore. Like, previously we were going to allow you to be so diverse in your choices well, that you were going to have, for example, like a Hellbound that could be like, this is a total healer character, or this is a total damage character. Like, that sort of breadth isn't the sort of thing that we have in our current builds anymore. It's more of, you know, you have primary things that you can do, you have secondary things that you can do, but at the end of the day, in this case, you're still a scout. So whether you're a scout that's focused on interacting with group and combat mechanics, or a scout that's focused on going out and moving quickly over a large area and being hard to detect, you're still a scout. So that sort of focus, that sort of role, and having that strong... Uh, Sorry, a bunch of guys are looking at us. And I'm there, there are? Yeah, they care what we're saying? And I don't know. Like something is wrong. Except uh, ask the guys on the stream, is there anything... I don't know. Is there a disaster? Tyler, is there anything going on? You keep looking at us. No, no, we're good. Oh, okay. Too many people talking to me, including you now. Okay. So, apparently you said 8-man and chat lost its shit. No, of course I did. <laughs> but I've said 9. I should have said 9. Well, I've said 10 before. Ten. I think I've said 7, too. Um, we have well, we do up. have a thing. Hang on. Tyler is walking yeah, over. He however, say that he got the server up. Woo! Uh, the server okay. Is up. There was okay. a bug in a math library that he wrote all the way back in 2002 that had reared its head. Um, 
bunch of questions about uh, counterplay. Can you kill a scout before his information makes it back? If you see that a scout has information, what can you do about that? And also, similarly, um, will these guys become the new buff bots? Is it going to be required for eight mans to multi-box a scout? Oh, God, no. Well, I think making their role active means that it would be hard to multi-box them. Exactly. Right? Like, you can't just have, for example, like a wisp on autofall because he's going to be running away from his lantern and he's going to be running his health down and he's eventually going to die and when he respawns he's not going to be with you anymore um, if you're having uh, you know a, a drog or, or a ascended running around or risen, risen. running around risen. changing names is fun yeah, risen. if you if you have uh, an arisen running around with you he's going to have a difficult time because he's going to have to die at some point and then run around and be a scout and having him as just a bot isn't really going to, he's not going to be doing any of his marking of things, he's not going out ahead of you and finding stuff for you um, so, and then when you get into a combat engagement, if he's just sort of standing there, he's not passively really doing any stuff for you, he doesn't have, you know a, an aura or anything around him that, that has a, a very significant effect at least, uh, and so it's, it's going to be hard to play them as, as a, a sort of passive character because they have active abilities that they really need to be doing. Now, can you multi-box that as opposed to just having a bot? Well, maybe, but you could multi-box two mages in the same way. So exactly. it's, uh, that's just sort of just questionable if, if people are running multiple characters in that way, which they do with every class. So uh, that's something that I don't think is really any different from this class than is, is possible with other classes. And keep in mind, folks, for those who, you know, are worried or truly worried about buff bots, this is a very different game, different mechanics, different problem, or the problems that we saw, obviously, with Dark Age or even other games have seen with the equivalent of buff bots in their game. We, we kind of know this, and... It doesn't mean that we're that we're going to have no multi boxing. There will be multi boxing, no matter what we do. We've said this even before the Kickstarter that do we want to see people with thirty two, you know, <laughs> screens up playing our game? No, we don't. And are we going to try to do something? Yes, we can. We will. But at the end of the day, if two, if one guy wants to have two computers that he's playing at the same time, there is literally no way that we can do anything about it because you cannot tell the difference between, you know, technically between two people sitting next to each other playing on whether it's a laptop, PC, whatever, and one person playing, you know, uh, with two machines. So, so if you manage to get a single game running with 32 screens, send me pictures of that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but no, these guys are not being designed as the next buff bots, these guys are not being designed to something that every, you know, group is going to want to have to have, or it's going to have to have with them. Same with sieges. That's not the same thing. I think the other part of that question had to do with, like, counterplay and, mm -hmm. and how to, oh, yeah, to that's deal with one. these guys. That, and it's kind of two separate questions, right, of right. them being bots and them, them having counters. Um, yeah, if you, if you can detect these guys and you can kill them, they're they sort of have the inclination to try to be sneaky and try to be slippery and try to, you know, avoid getting detected, but uh, part of uh, some of the things that we haven't gotten into with crafters and defenses and, and things uh, are going to make you harder to scout. Um, having scouts countering other scouts or having stealthers specifically counter scouts because they're both stealth classes and good at detection and things. Um, there will be some counterplay to them and things that scouts will have to watch out for because otherwise they would just be you know, kind of invulnerable, and, and they would just be able to be unhindered in their in their mission, and that's not exactly fun. They need to have threats and things that they worry about. Uh, we've got a couple questions on a similar vein, so let me see if I can't find them. Um, Rec asks, can you explain how the reduced detection slash sight mechanics work? Are these classes hard to see in their scouting forms, and how does that work? And someone else asked a similar question. Um, See if I can find it. Uh, well, they have abilities like dim vision that create a dark shroud around the target, so they can't see you as well. So, just some questions about how how uh, vision diminish works. How vision works. Okay, so there's uh, for the purpose of seeing things and, and detecting things. There's a, a vision stat and there's a detection stat. Vision uh, is based on your eyesight, so that's being able to see things just generally. And then there's detection, which is 
based on hearing, which is being able to, to detect things that are present that you can't necessarily see. Uh, and then for your, your scout character, or for every character actually, uh, there's concealment. Uh, and that's basically a check against those of how well you can be seen or detected. So being able to get higher concealment means that at a given distance, whether or not a character can see you or detect you. And so if you make someone's vision go down, they won't necessarily see you at the same distance. If you can make someone's detection go down, they won't necessarily even be able to detect you if they're very close to you. And if you can make your concealment go up, both of those effectively go down for all the opposing enemies. So there's this sort of back and forth of like, how well can you find things? How well can you be found? And the check between those two things and the manipulation of those ties into how well things can and can't be found. And can also apply with tracking abilities, right? And the sense of, and by tracking abilities, I mean any of our abilities, whether you know it's a fireball or other projectiles that are supposed to track somebody, you can have, uh, you can still think of it as a lock-on, like uh, in modern warfare, <laughs> uh, where you're locked onto the target, but you know it's not going to track you as well because it can't get as good of a read on your position. So as the fireballs, as uh, arrows, as other projectiles that aren't auto hit once you let them go are heading towards you, if your concealment is higher, that could affect its ability to actually track you as its arc is uh, being projected, or not even its arc, it's It's, it's know, tracking. It's, it's, it's a physics thing that our, our game does as far as having a stat that determines how strongly something can track. And so since that's a stat, it's a stat that could be changed based on factors. Exactly. Um, and it, again, this is something we haven't gotten into even prototyping yet and, and trying to do uh, that type of thing. But there's there's a lot of things that we can do to make uh, the sneakiness of these characters more apparent in ways that aren't necessarily directly tied to can you see this person, can you not see them. Exactly, and that's what's important. You know, because if, if it's just can you see them, uh, then there are ways, obviously where people, and hopefully they won't be able to cheat in our game, uh, but of course things always happen, uh, that even if people are doing some, you know, obviously have found a way through, that it's still server-based. Mm -hmm. So if some of the, if concealment actually works to help deflect an incoming projectile, it doesn't matter if you, ah, I know where you are, so I'm gonna fire. The server looks at that and goes, Nope, his concealment is too high, so this thing isn't going to track the way uh, it would if he was a totally visible character. And I think that's a cool thing to help uh, certainly not eliminate, but lower the effect of people hacking or anything else that's going to happen no matter how small we are. Yeah. Um, Travi Travi asks, uh, will scouts be able to mark maps or share information with their realm beyond text, voice chat? What might that look like? Would it be possible to link scout available scout abilities to some sort of web API map? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's actually one of the that's things. The short that, answer, isn't it? Uh, and that's actually <laughs> stuff we've already talked about. And that goes to what I said earlier about getting pats on the head from your realm. You know, if you're out there scouting and you're able to report back uh, to your king uh, that, hey, this is what I found, and it goes up on a map. All of a sudden, everybody in the game who has access to that can look at it and go, oh, wow, okay, we spotted something. Yeah, like a lot of the things that you see in other games where they automatically light up a lot of these mm -hmm. things on the map, where, you know, there's a big battle, and so it marks the big battles to tell you, oh, there's something over there that you should go and do. Uh, that's falling on the scouting class to report those things in, exactly. in this game. So it's not automatic. The map doesn't automatically tell you information. But scouts need to be able to disseminate information better than just chatting on TeamSpeak or whatever because that way it sort of communicates information to their realm and it allows them to contribute things beyond the scope of just the people that they know or the guild that they're a member of. It allows the network of scouts throughout a realm to sort of coordinate to put exactly. out this uh, net of detection and if they sort of let that fall down and aren't doing as good of a job, then their realm might be unaware of some other things that are happening. And so it will be an interesting counterplay to have of like, how how much information does your realm have? How, how well are you maintaining your control of what's going on in an area based on what you know is happening? 
Um, we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but it's a rephrasing of a question that um, I kind of like. So uh, Ben Robbins asks, have you considered a mechanic that allows scouts to be part of a group in addition to the eight-man core so that scouts aren't excluded uh, as deadweight once the fighting starts? I think sort of a, a better question is, you know, what in combat sort of buffs or debuffs might they have that, that sticks to their theme of information that'll contribute to the actual fight as opposed to in information beforehand. Do you mean the 10 man core? <laughs> 11. 12. We're going to add one every time you guys say 8 man. <laughs> um, right now, uh, what we've talked about is, you know, not having a group that is flexible where you can add on extra things to it uh, because that kind of gets into an escalation where, well, if I bring 8 and you bring 9 and then I'll bring 10 and then you bring 11 and then you know, it, it might be sort of hard to control in that way. Um, but you don't necessarily have to be in a group to be contributing to what groups are doing. Exactly. And so if your realm has multiple groups that are operating in an area and you have a few scouts that are either members of one of those groups but not members of others of them, like every group doesn't have its own scout, but one or two groups do have scouts, those scouts are all contributing to the information in that area, so they're all sort of cooperating even though they're not directly all in the same groups together or if you have scouts that are just out there solo and there are groups that are out there that don't have scouts in them because the scouts are contributing to the information on a realm basis that group is benefiting from the presence of the scout even though the scout isn't necessarily a member of the group of course there will be benefits to being a member of a group because they can have buffs and they can be protected and you know a, a lot of the things that they can do could tie into encounters that the group could get into and of course having chat and being able to actually report information much more concisely than the information that will be disseminated automatically back to the realm will be handy to have as well so you might be able to say hey it's this group from this guild and these people as opposed to there's so many enemies in this general area so being able to be part of a group and, and gain information like that does have its own benefits just intrinsically without even adding any specific gameplay mechanics exactly look this after all, is uh, effing magic, right? Um, <laughs> and so we can use things like magic, gee, to make the whole scouting thing, mapping thing, uh, quite different from what other games have done, you know, in the fantasy uh, uh, genre. So expect that these guys are going to have some very interesting mechanics when it comes to group play without them necessarily having to be in every group, which is also one of the reasons why I'm not worried at all about them being uh, buff bots for this uh, for this game. Uh, we've had a couple questions about um, scouts and their interactions with crafters. Will they, will they be able to pick up on uh, nodes or resources and things like that further away or have special abilities to assist um, resource gathering? Yes. Good. <laughs> That's uh, an easy one. We're getting close to the end of the stream, guys. Oh, yeah, so wow. make sure uh, uh, start throwing out those good yeah. questions, and I'll keep my eye open for uh, the favorite. And yeah, and you folks are doing a great job with questions this time. Got um, some really good ones. Yeah. McCavity, as a Wisp slash Spectre in a group, aren't you a huge liability since the main character body is left behind when your group is moving forward? Do you want to? Can the um, can the main body slash follow a group member <laughs> in the main character to prevent us from falling behind and or being we leashed on your wisp form? Um, also, somewhat similar question, somebody asked if you could give your lantern to a teammate. Uh, on the second part of that, yes, you can give your lantern to a teammate. Can you give your lantern? Can an enemy steal your lantern? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes? Is yes. That, are we letting that Well, happen? steal in the sense of take it from its current position. Uh -huh. You know, not just say, okay, you'll never get the lantern back. Well, they can reconstitute it if, Correct. It's, if it's lost. Exactly. Yeah, we'll have to come up with a way to do that. Yeah. You could. You can certainly pick it up because it's a thing that you put on the ground. Exactly. Um, and so anyways, there will right. have to be I, I think in the world that. in terms of how they affect group mobility and leaving the Whisper Spectre behind. Yeah, so uh, as far as the Wisp, what you would do is you would give your lantern to a group member and then you might leave your character somewhere else. Uh, and then the Wisp can sort of operate out, out of the group because one of the group people has the lantern with them. Uh, the Spectre can't really do that. He sort of needs to transfer his consciousness back and forth between his, his Spectre and, and his self. Uh, and so 
he will probably have a way to to drag his specter along with him. But if he wants to go out and use it, the specter is actually pretty fast uh, as as sort of one of his things. So he once he transfers into his specter, he can sort of do a sweep and then come back. But he won't be able to like the wisp. But like he can just operate completely independently of the lantern for quite a while and not have to necessarily come back and, and transfer back and forth as much. So so those things will be kind of different. Uh, the Draugr has a sort of problem with that because he has a fixed point in the world where his tombstone is that he has to operate off of. Uh, so he will have a little bit of a harder time unless he's operating within a, a more controlled area. But his area is pretty big by comparison. Like the Wisp and his Lantern are kind of cl closely tied together. Uh, the uh, Ascended... Uh, risen. Risen, the so just so you know, guys, this, especially <laughs> after the last uh, reveal where we went with a name that wasn't the Dulahan, mm. uh, and we got a lot of feedback on the forums. We had another debate today and yesterday and last week uh, <laughs> about naming, uh, whether we go with things like the Dulahan or Dragar or the other, some names that I will not be able to pronounce, and some of you will not pronounce, <laughs> as you've asked us and told us in emails and on the forums. So the Arisen name, uh, literally, we came up with that this morning. <laughs> well, but did we get it done before the morning, or was it after? No, it was this morning because yeah. it was in an earlier version of the document. There we go. So we did get it done this morning. It, today. it was right before lunch, I think. Yeah. So hard, hard to remember. Um, but he's going to have a little bit of a harder time. But his range is bigger, uh, so he he doesn't have as close of a tie to his location. But his location is kind of static, so he'll have to die and respawn and come back and pick a new spot and and air, oh, operate over an area. Uh, so if he's traveling over a, a very, very long distance, he'll probably want to wait until he gets where he's going and then start doing his scouting there as opposed to, you know, scouting the, uh, the entire time unless he's ro rowing like sort of a, a consistent area. And by the way, folks, as well, though, for the last few months, the name of that class had been Ghost Walkers. A <laughs> uh, couple questions in terms of sort of the positioning of scouts. Um, do you see scouts as being these sort of long-range characters that use their uh, their powerful senses, or do you expect them to get in, like, sneak into keeps and do close-range infiltration sort of things? It depends on what they're trying to do. Um, if they're just trying to generally look around in an area and see, like, well, how many players are there or something, they can just sort of look around and have a, a fairly good range they, they need to get into, you know, what we you would normally consider to be combat range, uh, because combat range, you know, in our game is fairly long. It's, this is not a, you know, 60 meters or 100 meters combat range like you see it in a lot of typical MMOs. But if you're in the range at which players are normally using abilities, that's sort of where vision is a little bit extended past that. So you have to get into range where players even could potentially detect you. You're not going to be, like, standing off on a cliff somewhere and marking everything that's, that's really, really far away from you. Um, but if you wanted to like sabotage something, you'd have to basically oh, get almost right personal. up to it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, and especially if you're like infiltrating keeps, when we start talking about resources and and finding out about like attrition levels and supply levels and stuff, if you want to find out about how much supplies is in a keep, you're actually going to have to get inside of it and be very very at risk of somebody finding you because you're a lot easier to find the closer you are to things. All right, I'm going to ask this, and then we're going to go for the last question. Um, so Dendavia asks, regarding reporting information, could we possibly see a delay in the relaying of information to the realm and realm mates? For example, scouts with higher level scouting abilities report information faster, or scouts forwarding information to each other faster, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. And there's more as well that we're not going to talk about yet, but absolutely. Look, that's a horizontal, that's an ability that fits nicely. Uh, into the horizontal framework because uh, you don't want that to get incredibly extreme where you could just go oh I report it goes up in the map one second later and it's spread to your entire realm uh, but it is one that is absolutely uh, a good one to progress. And it's not just their progression too, it's where they're reporting back to, right? That's because true you're, too. If you're reporting back to, say, a, a keep or something, and then that has to disseminate the information to other places, the dissemination of that information and the amount of time that it takes, the uh, level of detail that it has, stuff like that could be tied into structural upgrades and mm -hmm. uh, the different Either and that's the that stuff that I wasn't going to talk the, about yet. Oh, 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 okay. So I can't tell you about the cool stuff that we're doing with keep upgrades and having. Uh, okay. 
<laughs> well, you, you, you might punt on this question, then. It was oh, the question oh, okay. I was saving for the end, but feel free to kick okay. it. I'll grab another one. A uh, bunch of questions about traps and sabotaging. Right. Um, a little bit of that was going to be sort of the crafter's domain. Uh, scouts get a little bit of that. Can they interact with each other? Can a, can a crafter uh, disarm a scout trap? Can a scout disarm a crafter trap? Can you disarm traps at all? <laughs> talk about traps and sabotage. Yeah, traps. we can talk about traps. Okay. So they're sort of in opposition to each other. Crafters want to sort of set up traps and defenses and build siege equipment and do a lot of these things that they are... They just lost their shit about keep upgrades. They just they really <laughs> want to know. But I can't tell you about them. Um, but as, as far as traps and, and things go, yeah, crafters, that, that is kind of their domain is like crafting things, setting things up, building things, whether they're... Okay, well, hang on. Uh, so one thing I can tell you about keep upgrades... <laughs> You won't be able to buy them in a cash shop. <laughs> Just thought you should know. Anyway, go ahead. Right. So, <laughs> so crafters really are the ones who have to, uh, because they're creating all the equipment, they're creating all the buildings, they're also creating siege equipment, they're creating traps that they would lay out, they're creating, you know, magical detection fields and cool things that will be put around in the world for uh, these sort of purposes. And scouts sort of play against that, both finding them and reporting their existence so that you might know something is there that was intended to be secretive or hidden, uh, and also having some of these sort of sabotage types of abilities where, you know, you might go out and ruin a crafter's plans because their uh, traps that they all laid out have all been sabotaged or nullified in some way. So they've they thought swayzied. they were... They've been swayzied, as, as is popular on our forums, the Swayze class. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they can go out and they can do bad things to all of these uh, devices. So crafters will probably not like scouts very much in a lot of cases, or at least not the enemy enemy Correct. scouts. But if their scouts can detect that there are enemy scouts and their stealthers can go out and assassinate the scouts that are trying to sabotage all of their equipment. It's just, so there's this sort of layered play, uh, counterplay play. that is kind of the fundamental driving principle of a lot of our class design. Cool. So that pretty much wraps it up, as always. Thumbs up or thumbs down on this reveal, folks. <laughs> oh, Tim's making a bad face. <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to hit. Uh, uh, take us off slow mode. Mr. Zulu, make it so. I don't know who's doing that. Actually. I don't think anyone's doing that. <laughs> Joke's on me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to do that. Nice. I saw lots of uh, lots of thumbs up right before I changed. Oh, Tim, don't change. We love you just how you are. You wouldn't love me if I changed. <laughs> Depends what you changed into. <laughs> uh, we'll leave it on slow mode. This is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Can scouts detect pizza? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> really important. The pizza well, delivery. Caravan. Lots of. Uh, yeah couple people will just w are a little bit skeptical about our ability to pull it off. Oh, I, I, w I would be too. I mean, look, we've said this from the beginning about a lot of the BSC, well, frankly, all the BSC stuff. All the BSC stuff, stuff we've said. And this other things that we're trying difficult things. You know, it's easy to say, oh, we're a game that isn't going to be for everyone, and oh, we're going to be a game that's, you know, unique, and then not be so unique. We're everything, almost, well, not everything we're doing, so many things that we're doing really are unique. They really are different. They're not things found in either any other MMO or the vast majority of MMOs. So everyone has a right to be skeptical. You should be skeptical. We're skeptical. Yeah. You have to be. I mean, Ben will come up with an idea. I will come up with an idea. Tim, anyone. And we need to be skeptical. We always have to remember that if you're going to try something easy, sure, you know, you're going to pull it off. But when you try something difficult, when you try something different, when you try to create something in your game that is unique, that isn't, or even isn't totally unique, but has not been seen very often, then there's a chance of failure. Big deal. Sort of a high risk, high reward, right? Exactly. Like, this is, as I said, I think probably the most difficult trio for, for me to design, for, for us to create, because it's not something that you see in other games at least not in this context and so the things that we can pull from don't necessarily even cross over so when we talk about drawing comparisons to things that we've done with other classes in other games which might have had you know a couple of abilities that worked sort of this way or even stuff outside of 
you know, MMOs where there's other examples of things like this, or even talk about like, well, what would the real world uh, examples of these things be? Of like, how do saboteurs actually do this type of stuff? How much spying, you know, actually is there? And there's a lot of things that come into this that don't necessarily have a direct one-to-one -one correlation of something that we could just say, oh, we're making a mage. You know, hundred examples of how to make a mage and and, and how not to make at. a mage. Yeah, and and how how you could do it wrong, right? There, there's a lot of postmortems on stuff like that of like, oh, this class was bad because of this reason, or this game had these problems because of these reasons, and you can sort of look at how things turned out and and derive the stuff from that. But this is one of those things where we just don't know. Exactly. And so that makes it a very high risk. But if we can pull it off, it's something that could create a very different experience. Could have an appeal to a, a, an audience that doesn't necessarily know what they're looking for and, and doesn't know oh of course we want to play scouts because i played scouts in every other game you know like you would have to try this out and find out but it's a it's different enough that it could be really appealing and really fun for someone who didn't necessarily know that this was what they were looking for exactly and that's one of the reasons i hope most if not all of you backed our game and backed our kickstarter pitch and continue to donate to our game because we're trying to do different things we're not just you know another mmo under a slightly different name with a slightly different veneer that's essentially still doing the same things. We are trying to do something different and other studios are also trying to do something different in this field and we certainly want you know to be <laughs> one of the leaders in doing you know kind of crazy stuff and perfect example. Yeah. All right well look uh, that wraps up Friday. Uh, Friday's update uh, it will be coming out Probably next hour or so. It's a fairly short update, mainly because we had the huge user story update uh, last week. Uh, the survey, the next survey, is ready to go. Uh, frankly, as soon as I'm done, uh, we're done. I'm going to push a button or three buttons because I need three different <laughs> email collectors for all the players we have or backers we have. Uh, so that survey is going to go out. And hopefully, I mean, last I heard, uh, about 10 minutes ago that the server is ready to go and if it is uh, we'll get some of you folks in for at least an alpha test hopefully this weekend but if things go well maybe we can get some betas in as well uh, it really depends on whether we have to have the server hooked up to the uh, the debugger yeah. uh, tonight uh, or a debug version and if we don't then maybe we can get folks in and if not, it certainly will be next week. So, uh, from all of us, as always, thanks for the support. Happy Halloween uh, to those who uh, will enjoy themselves this weekend. It is one of my personal favorite <laughs> holidays. I love Halloween. I adore Halloween. Uh, and it's, it really pisses me off when you see people in this country tr trying to take it away from people and take the fun away from Halloween. So enjoy yourselves. Eat lots of candy if you're getting it. <laughs> uh, make sure your kids eat lots of candy because that's the point of Halloween. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great weekend, everybody. And if we have the servers up, I'll see some of you in the game. If not, I know I'm going to see some of you on the forums <laughs> yes. real shortly. That's it. Have a great weekend, folks.